from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, longtime DallasCowboys.com scribe and just all knower of things Dallas Cowboys and football Mr. Nick Harris and uh, Nick we'd be uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't a congratulate you on the new gig number one so well done for you on that yes sir uh, and we do appreciate you taking time out of your busy evening to talk uh, you know what was a uh, rather mm, gut punch if you will uh, on a number of different levels let me ask you this uh, you've been doing this for a long time You've been, you know, you've been in the the, the belly of the beast, so to speak, uh, when it comes to writing for the Dallas Cowboys. What would be the general feel around the facility after a game like yesterday? Yeah, well, first off, I appreciate the kind words, fellas, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, the general feel around the building, um, you know, kind of talking to some people today and, and getting an understanding of kind of how the aura is in the building today coming off of the loss yesterday um, uh, definitely a, a wake-up call. Um, you know, Eric Kendricks, I think, said it best in the locker room yesterday. It was served a, a, a slice of humble pie, and I, I think it was just more so a reflection of how far this uh, this team on both sides of the ball still has to go, whether that be from personnel standpoint, experience standpoint, scheme standpoint. I think you could pinpoint a lot of different things that played, uh, you know, catalyst roles into that loss yesterday, and it's you know, I, I've been trying to find maybe one thing that stood out the most, and, and I don't really think there is. I think you could look at uh, the run defense. Obviously, was awful yesterday. It was, it was horrid. Uh, you look at the running game. I think that's probably where you start looking at personnel issues. Uh, and then you look at scheme issues necessarily whenever, you know, Jake Ferguson is outed from, uh, you know, being able to play in a contest. How do you make up for him, uh, especially whenever mm-hmm. there's, a, there's still a small lapse and the connection between Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb. So, you know, offensively, I I feel like they're still figuring out a lot of things too. So uh, many different catalysts, but as far as the overall feel, um, definitely a slice of humble pie that was served to those guys. But uh, they had a team meeting at 2 o'clock. They addressed all the things in film today. And uh, they said they're moving on to Baltimore as early as tonight, you know, getting on the film on Baltimore and trying to move forward. And Mike Zimmer, he he compared it to the uh, pickle juice game all the way back in 2000, which I'm sure CA was front row for. I was there. but uh, he said, we fixed it after that game and we'll do it again this time. So, um, you know, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the mentality right now. But obviously a lot of concerns if you're in the fan base. Okay, here's another reason to be concerned. We'll just see how it plays out. Again, I think I've come to the conclusion that this team is built wrong. Um, in other words, now that you've got a blueprint out there of how to beat the Cowboys, they cannot stop the run. And they're, they're built to, to stop passing. Uh, Dak Prescott and C.D. Lamb are a pass combo. So offensively, they, they they decided to not really run the ball as opposed to being complimentary running and passing. So with that being said, <clears throat> you know what's happening this weekend. Uh, coming coming Sunday, you got a Baltimore Ravens team that not only hasn't won a game and got a lot to prove to all their naysayers, but they are built to run. Our buddy Saad Youssef from The Athletic, he had a, a text that, or a tweet that went out. I'm going to paraphrase it. That the Ravens, this century, all of, since 2000, they are the most run dominant team in the NFL. You know they've got Derrick Henry. What would you do if you were Zim, <laughs> Nick? Yeah, I, I'm isolating that backfield, and I'm I'm trying to stop it there. You know, and uh, I, I think you had the personnel to do that. You, you have the scheme to do that. Uh, you know, where is the where's the effort and where's the intention? I think that's probably where the problem lies within. If you look at, mm-hmm. you know, what happened yesterday, whenever, whenever you look at the middle of that defensive line and you see four guys in there, Mozzie Smith, Osa Digizua, uh, Linval Joseph and Jordan Phillips, the highest run defense grade per PFF from any of those guys was Mozzie Smith with a 30.2 mm-hmm. uh, out of 100. So mm-hmm. I, you have to have better play in that interior defensive line. You got to have those guys getting off blocks. You know, there were times where uh, they were being isolated one-on-one with the center and the left guard from the Saints, uh, Lucas Patrick, and it made the life for the linebackers so damn difficult because they are having to pick which – they're going to have to cover two gaps at one time. Meanwhile, another blocker is coming straight for them because they're getting into the second level already. So that that defensive front has to play better, and it starts with that interior defensive line. I think if those two positions in the middle can play better – and I think it's a domino effect to the rest of that front seven. But uh, nevertheless, if they want to stop Baltimore, it has to start with stopping their running game. Uh, I think you'll see a lot more of DeMar being overshown in this game as oh, well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, there's going to be a lot of intention and effort put into that this week. Put it like this, um, Alvin Kamara, who looked like vintage 2022 Alvin Kamara, um, that running game in the first half, they were averaging like 14 yards a touch. 
And and then on top of all that, Kamara's longest run. I mean, this is it wasn't like he had some long run for forty yards or no. He was I think his longest run was like fourteen or fifteen yards. So they were just gashing him. And as you mentioned, they made the linebackers' jobs hell because those guys up front they weren't getting it done. And then they decided to go to the edges. It's like okay, now that we chopped up the middle, let's go to the edges. It's going to be hell. I, I, wait, I, I I talk too much, Fred. You got some questions. Yeah, I agree with you. They were brutalized at the point of attack. I, I mean, whenever you look at, go back and watch it, the the all twenty two film. These guys were getting off the ball in a hurry, and, mm. and they didn't need the they didn't need the big runs because they were getting the chunk yeah. seven, eight, nine yard runs on a consistent basis. Uh, they they couldn't stop them, um, and it, it eventually led to Kamara having arguably the second biggest game of his career. Nick Harris, Fort Worth Star Telegram, joining us here on the DM Leasing Hotline, talking all the things Dallas Cowboys after the uh, 44-19 spanking yesterday. Uh, one thing that I think is going overlooked uh, about this performance, and again, I mean, look, you're, and I know I see this now that I'm immersed in it here in the Dallas media. Uh, Dak, look, Dak could have gone and, and saved 17 kids under a bridge last night, and it would have mattered because people would have uh, blamed him for the loss yesterday. When you look at the first two games of last year versus the first two games of this year, I think the one thing that jumps off the page to me is, guess what? He was sacked once through the first two games uh, last season. He's already been sacked six times through the first two games of this year. Where are we at with this offensive line? I get it. We've got two rookies on there. You lose a perennial uh, All-Pro and maybe future Hall of Famer in uh, Tyron Smith. But at the same time, I mean, look, this group has struggled so far at times, and I get it. You played Miles Garrett and you played a dadgum good uh, New Orleans Saints off or excuse me defense. Where are we at with this offensive line through two weeks? Yeah, and I think it's, I, there, there's a really good point to be made there, but I, I do agree with your context there in saying that, you know, they were going up against two really powerful def- defensive fronts mm. in the Browns and in the uh, Saints over the course of the last couple of weeks. I mean, Miles Garrett uh, and those guys that they had last week uh, for the Browns, and then this week Cameron Jordan, Carl Granderson, those guys got after it, Granderson specifically. Uh, but, yeah, they are still figuring some things out up front. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen Terrence still get broken down once or twice. We've seen Zach Martin give up a sack, and that, that was the first sack of the year. Yeah. Uh, we've seen Tyler Guyton, you know, get, get beat a couple of times as well. I, I, it, it, the, the, the bright side is that it's not one specific guy giving up a ton of pressures and a ton of sacks. We saw that early in the season last year with Terrence Steele, and then he was eventually able to rebound and had a really strong uh, back half of the season once he got his legs under him. Uh, but this year, it's, it's more so it's, – it's very much been divvied out. And I think the, the guy who's played the most consistent – has been Cooper Beebe, which uh, has to offer some confidence as well. Only one pressure given up in 62 pass block snaps, if my memory serves me correctly. And he's he hasn't allowed a sack. He's been strong. He's been commanding up front in his declarations. And I think if you look at that from a rookie third-round pick, you have to like at least where the direction is going. Uh, but, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think also a part of that is Dak needs to escape a little bit better. Um, you know, He admitted it yesterday in his press conference availability. If mm-hmm. he, he was saying, hey, I'm not using my legs enough. Yep. That's the first thing that I can diagnose. I can get out of the pocket a little bit more and extend some plays. And, and, you know, going back on the film today, you certainly see that. You know, there's a couple of opportunities where he's sitting in the pocket maybe a fraction too late. Whereas if he escaped, he could have made some things happen around the edge. So whether that be him scrambling or just letting some receivers get open a little bit. But, you know, that off script stuff, that is where, you know, the big plays came about last year, especially Mm -hmm. after the bye week, wherever he was able to extend plays Mm -hmm. with his legs, get out of the pocket, and then, you know, find a receiver downfield. Unfortunately, we just haven't seen that so far. Let's talk about a curiosity. Uh, On defense, we were talking about uh, DeMarvion Overshone. He was missing in action, but then they said he wasn't part of that base defense on offense. What was this utilization of the running backs and Zeke didn't get into the game basically until like the second quarter? I'm just trying to figure out what they're trying to do with Deuce Vaughn and and Rico Dottle. Did they say anything today at the star about what the hell they're trying to do? I mean, I'm not even talking about Dalvin Cook yet. I'm just talking about what were I was thought it was so bizarre. Yeah, I'm with you, CA. I I would love to know what the plan and strategy is too, because I'm not quite understanding it. Uh, But from what was communicated today, a, they're trying to get those guys more reps, and they obviously have not had those reps through the first two games. Uh, you look at Ezekiel Elliott, 16 carries for 56 yards. Rico Dattle, 16 carries for 55 yards, and then Deuce Vaughn, uh, four car- or, excuse me, three carries for 15 yards going into uh, uh, this next week. So I mean, those guys have to get more touches. Um, but as far as the Ezekiel Elliott issue and him not getting a snap until 2:46 to go in the first quarter. Um, you know, it was communicated more as a personnel thing. And, and you know, the, the, the personnel that New Orleans 
started the game out with. Mm-hmm. They felt more comfortable with Rico Dowdle there in the run game. And that's what eventually, you know, ended up happening. That's why he started the game. And then um, we saw that run in those first couple of series of him on the field. But, you know, to me, I, I don't feel like there's enough creativity in the run game scheme. Yep. The only creativity that we have seen in the running game has been personnel based. It's getting Brandon Cooks, Kevontae Turpin, C.D. Lamb involved, mm-hmm. where that just tells me that they don't rely. They're not relying on the personnel or they're not trusting the personnel that's in the backfield for them. You know, and if, if they did, they would be a little bit more creative in getting those guys into running lanes. So, uh, you know, I, I think this thing is just trending more and more towards, you know, they're eventually being, you know, a, a big change there. But, um, you know, how much time they actually give that, you know, that's going to be way to be seen. This is so bizarre. And I'm glad you brought this up because, trying to be creative what was so bizarre about uh, yesterday's game they had Ezekiel Elliott going towards the edges which he doesn't do anymore at his age and the miles on his body and they had Deuce Vaughn trying to run up the middle and he's too tiny I was like it should be the other way around with that being said as you know with running backs you've got to use them over and over and over again so they can like pound and pound and pound or whatever you can't they got to get into a rhythm and if you're doing it by committee and these guys are only getting X number of touches every, you know, every other drive, what it's so inconsistent, nobody can I'm gonna put it like this, and I said this over and over again. If you're gonna be, bring Zeke back, and I love Zeke, and I've always said he's situational at this point in his career, you gotta have a feature back. You should brought you should have brought back Tony Pollard. You should have said, you know what? Tony start like he did last time, or the end of the end of Zeke's career, the first time with the, with the uh, Cowboys, and have are their friends. They got chemistry. Have Zeke situation. Pollard uh, get the ball. You know, eighteen touches or whatever. I just thought if you're gonna do all that by, by, with a pair of backs, bring back Pollard. But it's too late for that now. They gotta have, they gotta have a real feature back. So I'm concerned. Yeah, in 2023, the running game was complimentary enough. Was it the most complimentary running game in the NFL? Absolutely not. But it, it helped facilitate that offense. Yep. It kind of helped be that oil change for the offense whenever they needed it. I mean, Tony Pollard was still a thousand yard back at the end of the day. And yep. he, uh, as the season went on, especially there on the back half, he was able to finally break through and have a couple of big runs. Mm-hmm. The, the game in Carolina stands out. The, uh, the final game against the commander stands out. Uh, but I think you look at this running game here in 2024, there is nothing complimentary about it right now. It's and it's, it's forcing and it's pressing this passing game that is still trying to figure things out in its own right. Not only is Jake Ferguson now battling a knee injury and, you know, he missed the game, but Dak and CD still trying to get exactly on the same page. We saw that happen a couple of times in the game where, you know, they were not on the same page. And that's something that's going to have to be increased with reps going into this week in practice and whatnot. So uh, they, they need, they need, reliability and any stability in that running game and we're not seeing it at all all right nick you know one thing i've been uh kind of harping at and i said this even after the cleveland game and uh, you know as as you know you i mean you want to say look dominant but then of course that second half left a lot to be desired 49 total yards and when you look at this offense through two games i mean you've had a few i mean you really you've had two fluky touchdowns like if, if we're really being honest about it right i mean okay you had the brandon cooks that was a good drive and then you know dak saw something at the line of scrimmage boom you, you got brandon cooks and let's call it what it is you know saints miss a, a what should have been an easy tackle and 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 cd does what cd does and takes it to the house otherwise you know again you've had no real major offense production you certainly have done zero in the red zone Who's this playmaker outside of CD as this season goes on? Because one thing, you know, CA and I have talked about is this, you know, through the first two weeks is, you know, you're going to see, and what we saw yesterday was what, okay, you saw a team say, all right, we're going to take Mike out of the out of the picture. Suddenly a defense is going to say, you know what, we're going to take CD out of the picture. Who's going to be that playmaker? Who can be that guy? And you've got a Jalen Tolbert who had maybe the quietest 6 of 82 I think I've ever seen. Why are we not going to see more out of Jalen? And, and, or are we going to see more out of Jalen? And how do we get more? How do we put him more in space? How is it that a guy like a Mike McCarthy, who, again, who's been around this game a long time, and yet we just saw Clint Kubiak coach circles around him offensively yesterday? Yeah, I, I think they have playmakers. I, I do. I do think that they have guys outside of CD Lamb in the passing game that can help facilitate, you know, big offensive production. Uh, Jake Ferguson, I feel like, is the second biggest passing True. weapon on this team. Yep, big I, I think Brandon Cooks is a serviceable weapon, even though he is, you know, 11 years into the league. And that speed, that route running, that's still on full display. Those strong hands, we've seen that time and time again. Those are reliable guys. And I think Kevontae Turpin is starting to grow into his own right. He had one of the best training camps that was very little. Uh, very smallly talked about um and i think he's going into this year a little bit more confidence in the offensive system 
but I'm going to sound like a broken record here. The running game, <laughs> not yep. having a running game, it only neutralizes yeah. those, those weapons because the defense isn't taking your running game seriously. Exactly. I, I, said it, I said it on a podcast this morning. If I am the Baltimore Ravens, they probably won't do this because they like to play big man bully football. But if I am the Baltimore Ravens, I'm coming out in dime package on Sunday, and I am telling the Dallas Cowboys, run the ball because I don't believe that you can. Right. And until if they show that they can, then I'll go back in a base defense. But until mm-hmm. then, I'm in dime. I'm putting five guys in the box, six DBs, and I'm trying to shut down your passing weapons because I feel like that's the only way you can beat me. And I, I think if any defense is, is scouting the Dallas Cowboys, that's got to be the conclusion. It's, it's an easy eval at this point. They need to figure out how to make it a tough eval. I'm going to tell you something, you exactly why. Watch those safeties stay deep and watch, those, watch it be a dime defense all game long on Sunday. Man, appreciate the call. Appreciate you joining us, man. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate y'all. Y'all have a great night.